John chapter 20. Appreciate everybody being here tonight. And uh, I, I guess I shouldn't complain about the weather. Uh, usually this time of year we're either getting snow or worse, we're getting freezing rain or sleet or icy conditions and, and uh, those are just things. The snow doesn't bother me. I can drive in snow and uh, I've made enough driving in snow. I remember I got cocky one year, got arrogant, and I was in Bible college and I went home for Christmas break. This was, uh, I think it was my first year. And uh, so I went home for Christmas break, drove all the way from uh, Moore, Oklahoma, which is just south of Oklahoma City. Uh, you just take 35 up to 44 and just ride 44 until uh, you get close to home, close to Festus. But anyway, I... Um, I remember that uh, I was going to go down to Arkansas first and visit my grandparents, my aunt and uncle down there, and my cousin, and all them, and I hadn't seen them in a while, and I just wanted to visit with them for a day, and then I was going to take 40 out to Oklahoma City from Little Rock, and so I get up that morning, get ready to go, and, and the news is forecasting snow moving through northern Arkansas. And uh, my mom was watching that, and she said, uh, uh, maybe you ought not go today. I don't, I don't know. It, it might get bad out there. I said, uh, Mom, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Famous last words. Freshman in college, right? I already know everything. And uh, so, Mom, I'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And this, I want to tell you something. Young people, listen to this. This is how God will use your parents when you don't want them to. Okay, so anyway, I told her, I said, I'm going to go. If I run into any problem, I'll call you. She said, okay. And before I backed out of the driveway, she slipped me some money. And she said, use this in case you have any problems. And if you don't, then put it on your school bill. <laughs> so... I pull out of the driveway and I look at it, 60 bucks. Man, that's like $300 nowadays. And so anyway, I don't see who's trying to get a hold of me for whatever reason. Anyway, um, I started off and I got past uh, Poplar Bluff. Everything was fine. And then uh, you, I got into uh, North Central uh, Arkansas and just before you get to Newport Arkansas here come the snow and I didn't I didn't realize it but it was a heavy heavy band of snow that was moving through northern Arkansas now Arkansas is not known for their ability to push snow off the road they're not known for that neither is Oklahoma and um, so anyway um, I was driving right in the midst of it. It was a narrow band, but it was very heavy. And you know how if you've ever driven in snow, those flakes coming towards you, they have a hypnotic effect. And I started getting, I was doing okay with the driving part, but I started getting sleepy, bad sleepy. Uh, huh? Well, I, yeah, I didn't have any sunglasses in. And so anyway, I'm, I'm just like, man, I, I want to I keep going. I want to keep going. I want to keep going. But the farther I went, the sleepier I got. And so I got into this little town in Arkansas called Tuckerman. I'm sure you've been there on vacation several times, okay? And uh, Tuckerman's about, oh, it's about the size of two hematites, Okay. So anyway, I, I know and remembered, because I've been down that road a hundred times, I knew that there was a little rinky-dink motel there, one of them old ones, 
And uh, I thought, I'm going to have to pull in here. And the snow at that time was probably about three to four inches. And it was still coming down hard as it could come down. It was coming down. And so I pulled in there, and I went into the office, and I asked, the guy was an Iranian guy, and this is 1985. And us in Iran, we just didn't have a good relationship. But anyway, I asked him, I said, can, can I get a room for tonight? And he said, yeah. And I said, how much will it be? He said, like $19.50. I'm going, well, that leaves me with 40 bucks. Okay. So I paid him 20 bucks. He gave me the keys to the room. Uh, I drove down a little ways to find some food to eat. And I drove back and I got in the room and I called my mom. And I said, mom, I'm here. I'm fine. I'm in Tuckerman. I'm going to spend the night here and wait for him maybe to kind of the snow to quit and kind of clean the roads off. She said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to call your me mom people and tell them where you are and tell them what's going on. I said, I appreciate that. So I'm sitting there just, you know, watching cable TV all night and I have a good night's rest and I'm going, well, I can't wait to spend this 40 bucks. So at that time, Highway 67 going south was mostly a one lane after you get out of Poplar Bluff. Well, they've changed all that now, but you didn't get into the four lane until you got to Newport, Arkansas. So I'm driving the next morning. There's eight inches of snow, okay? That, and Arkansas just don't get that. So I pulled out of there, just drove kind of slowly, and then I got to Newport and I saw that it turned into four lanes, so I got on that four lane, and I started getting very comfortable and very arrogant because I'm saying I'm saying to myself now listen to this John I'm saying to myself I'm from Missouri we know how to drive in snow so I thought it was like a birth thing that you know you had and so I drove past this guy I was doing the speed limit which back then was 55 drove past this guy he was doing probably 35 40 and I just kind of <laughs> giggled at him going you don't know how to drive in this like I do and I swear to you, I got, I got a mile ahead of him and my rear end just turned around like this and did it about three or four times and wham, down into the ditch and right up against the uh, little rock ledge there. Oh, no. Well, guess who stopped? That guy. He said, you need help, real nice guy, do you need help? Yeah, yeah, I need a tow truck. He said, well, get in. He said, I, they're down the next exit. I know where you can get one. So he took me down the next exit, got this little town. And I told that guy, I said, I just need pulled out of the ditch. I got in the ditch. He said, okay, get in the truck. And I got in the truck. And uh, he must have been waiting on me all morning. Because we got down to the car. He unhooked that, that uh, wire rope he had and hooked it on the front of my Plymouth Volari and uh, with four on the floor and uh, turned that winch on and pulled me right up there on the road. I said, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, how much do I owe you? He said, $40. <laughs> I'm not, you ask my mom if I'm making that up. There went my money, my pizza money, everything gone. So, your mama will help you. I mean, it's, it's amazing. She gave me 60 bucks. And God spent every bit of it for me. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. We're going to have, we're going to spend eternity just laughing with God at all the stuff that he did to us. Amen. All right, let's get serious. Uh, who in here was, was a former Roman Catholic? Raise your hand. I know Melissa was. I know you were. Um, so did you ever go to confession? You went, you went. Did the priest try to like pressure you to tell more than what you were telling? Didn't have to with you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> The Latin one? 
absolve, yeah, in nomine, in nomine patri et fili et spiritu sancto, okay. Um, I, I, and I've covered all this before, but it's, it's part of what we're going to learn tonight. John chapter 20, verse 19. Let's read the scripture. Uh, this is the resurrection now. He's, he's gone. Uh, this is the same day. Uh, Mary Magdalene has seen him and so on. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were... And I like that, first day of the week. To God, this is why we worship on the first day. It's why we do it. Anybody pressure you into uh, mandatory Sabbath worship. I don't care if you worship on the Sabbath. I don't care. In fact, I, I, that's a good day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But God is honored in the law. The law says to rest. And don't tell me how well you keep the Sabbath when you're out digging ditches and doing all kinds of stuff that you ain't supposed to do. God gave you a day of rest. Use it. But anyway, um, uh, where was I going with that? But anyway, um, I, I like the fact that we are on the first day of the week, that first things belong to God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. This being the first day of the week, it is the eighth day of the previous week. Eight is a number for new beginnings. And isn't it amazing that the number eight never stops? In, in fact, there is an occult symbol called the infinity symbol, and it's a sideways eight. And pay attention to that, because you, you, you see it in a lot of places. Um, I got this website called 666adsalert.com. Um, we lost the 666alert.com because uh, I didn't renew it quick enough, so we had to change the website a little bit. But you'll see examples. You'll see example after example after example of, of, of how triple sixes will be in packaging, marketing, you name it. It's every, in fact, I sent two of them today, uh, this afternoon, uh, just going out with, with Lisa. And, uh, and that has an effect on the mind. People see these things and it, it does work in their mind. I could talk about subliminal suggestion tonight, but I won't. But anyway, it has an effect on the mind. But anyway, this is the eighth day of the week, the first day of the new week, and so on. It's a new thing, and this is Christ now. He's brand new. He's, he's alive from the dead. And is he going to die again? Never, never, ever, ever will Jesus die again. He did, and he will, not take, he will not come to put our sins upon himself again. He's already done it. And since he's already done it, there's no need to do it again. Amen. The government may do it that way, but not Jesus. Amen. So anyway, the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Isn't that something? When, and, and came Jesus and stood in the midst. That goes along with what I was preaching Sunday. There he is in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, we're not told how he came in, but I just kind of think he just like, boom, there he is. He just showed up. He has that ability. He's God. He can do that if he wants. And we know for a fact that he did it. And uh, I like that story where the, the crowd is kind of pushing in and pressing on Jesus. And Jesus just walked right through them like they weren't there. And nobody felt him. Nobody saw him. Nobody. It's like he just like turned into a, a fourth dimensional thing and just walk through them, okay? I like that stuff. Beam me up, Jesus, amen. So he saith unto them, peace be unto you. And when he had said, when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. They knew he had died. They knew it. And now they see him alive. Can you imagine? Here we are on Sunday, the first day of the week. And the disciples are sitting there at the table. And they're probably just like, oh man, what happened to our, our Savior? Well, I don't know if we could, should continue on with this or not. And all of a sudden he shows up. And now they're glad, their hearts are glad. Peace be unto you, he says. As my Father hath sent me, 
Even so send I you. And look at where they are now. They're all over the world. There isn't a country in this world that doesn't have a copy of the Bible in it. Even North Korea, where you could get killed. You can get shot. You can get blown up. You can, you can, you can end up in a North Korean labor camp with your family because they always punish your family when you do something wrong because that, that works on you. And so anyway, but there, I guarantee you there's a copy of the Word of God somewhere floating around in that country. Amen. And so, um, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. We talked about this last Wednesday, so I'm not going to recover all that, but I'll just kind of flip through it real fast. He breathed on them. Now, understand this. He is now in a... He, is, he still has the nail prints in his hand, the wound in his side, probably the scars from the thorns that was uh, tapped on his head. He probably has the stripes on his back, but he's different. And he's never, ever going to die. He's not going to feel pain and so on. And so he breathes on them at this time. And he saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now, what, we're going to get into this tonight. What does the Catholic Church, how is it that they, and who else does this? Um, Mormons do it. I think, I think the Lutherans. I don't know that they have a confessional per se, but I know in a Lutheran service, the Lutheran priest will stand there with his hands like this, like he's really something, and he'll say something along that. And I didn't know this till I, uh, I was, Decided I was going to watch a couple of Lutheran services just to see what they how they believe and what they do and so on And he stands there like this and he says uh, God Christ has has bestowed upon me the power of the priesthood and I have the power to forgive and absolve you of all your sins and so he says to them I uh, I absolve you from all of your sins that you have committed they are now gone or something like that in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he believes now and those poor people believe that their sins are gone. They haven't confessed anything. They've not asked for this. They've not gone to God in prayer and say, God, will you forgive me? Will you allow that priest to absolve me of my sins. They don't even do that. He just stands there. He's got his hands like this. He must have like rays of forgiveness. Forgiveness rays coming out of his hands. Yeah. And forgiving everybody's sins. Burning it off of them or whatever. And I watch that and I'm going. I can't believe this. Those people. Their salvation is not in the hands of God. It's in the hands of that man. And if that man doesn't want to forgive him, what are they going to do? So anyway, when he had said this, he breathed on him and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now, the, the Catholic Church, the Lutherans, the Mormons, and whoever else, Believes that the man has the power to either forgive you or not forgive you. See, that's what I don't like. That's the part I don't like. That, the part about if God truly gave it into the hands of a minister to forgive someone of their sins, so be it. I don't see it in the Bible, but so be it. But I have a huge problem with that same man refusing to absolve me of my sins. Because that man is a man. He's carnal just like the rest of us. And he's got an attitude to go with it. 
And if that man don't like you, if that man's got something against you, or that man's just, if he's drunk, which that's not out of the question, if he's drunk, if he's an evildoer or whatever it is, he, he may not forgive you. And so where are you then? You're stuck. Your salvation has been put into the hands of a sinful, wicked man. And it's not right. Your, your salvation is not in my hands. I will not take the blame. I will, not, I will not take on the responsibility. I don't want it. And where you spend eternity, that is you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, the Bible says. So what does this mean then? Why, why did Jesus say this if it wasn't to give the apostles a priesthood whereby they forgive the sins of the church? What does that mean then? Now, uh, remember the, when Jesus breathed on them, that's the Holy Ghost, that's, that's the menorah there or the candlestick. The seven candles are the seven spirits of God. The decorations are 66, showing us that it's the Word of God, the Bible, uh, in the 66 books, and so on. Now, um, he says this, he said, you, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. To remit means to apply payment to it. Uh, that's what you do with bills. Please remit. And so now the bill has to be paid. And so that priest will, uh, thinks he can say, I'm going to remit you of your sins. And now all your sins are paid for. They're all gone. They're over with. And so on. Um, by the way, let me just throw this in here. I found that picture. I thought that was a pretty good one. He's listening to Chris. Going, whoop, my goodness. How many times? Yeah, with who? <laughs> now listen, I'm going to be dead serious. You guys know uh, my stand on this thing. The, the Catholic confessional booth is one of the most wicked pieces of real estate in the world. That priest, uh, if you get a chance, read the book, The Priest, The Woman, and The Confessional, written by a, a Canadian, a French-Canadian, former Catholic priest by the name of Charles Chiniqui, back in the 1800s. And he wrote and, and exposed the secrets that go along with the confessional. When a Catholic priest insists that you give a, what they call a good confession, that means that they're not going to be satisfied with you just saying, uh, I smoked a pack of cigarettes, uh, I had one drink of whiskey this week, I think I said some curse words about eight times, nine times, something like that. They're not going to be content with that, especially, especially the young or the women or the men that they want. They will force especially children to start telling all of the things that went through their mind in the course of a week. All the dirty things, all the dirty thoughts that they had. And they have to describe these in detail to this priest. Now this priest, he's grooming those children in that confessional. And he is finding out who's a, who's a target and who isn't. And I've told a lot of stories in the videos that I've made, but one in particular... Uh, was this young man, this boy, going to a Catholic school and the priest uh, started on him and started molesting him. And early on, 
the priest told that boy that he had talked to his mother and his mother agreed to this action that he was taking. And because his mother had some serious sins and they needed special prayers to be prayed and that if the boy went along with it, then he would pray these special prayers for his mother and his mother would spend less time in purgatory. And he wrapped that boy in bondage. And that boy grew up hating his mother. I mean hating her. Because he believed what that priest said. Finally, when it all came out, the mother in tears said, I never said anything. I would, I would never say anything like that. And that, that man now found out the truth. That priest played him and played, prayed on him and turned him into his victim. And I'm telling you what, that is an evil that I, I don't know that there is a higher evil than that. But every one of those priests are going to get everything they've got coming. Everything. So anyway... Does that passage give a priesthood or a clergy or a special group of people in the church the ability to forgive sins uh, or to retain sins and basically they go on in unforgiveness. Now, I'm not talking about uh, if you said something to somebody one day and it was just way out of line and you realized it and you went back to them and said, look, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry for what I did. Will you forgive me? The, that's not what I'm talking about. Our sins against one another, absolutely. We should, we should seek forgiveness and those who need to forgive, you should forgive. That's tied in with your salvation. Uh, and, and, if you, and if you need help with it, ask God. I promise you, God will help you. He will, he will relieve you of the burden that of, of someone else and what they did to you or what they did to people you love. Eventually, God will relieve you of that and you can go on with your life and say, that's behind me. I'm done with it. Uh, it's over with. I can forgive them. I don't, I don't want to live with them. I don't want to be around them anymore. I don't, I don't want that. We're not compatible. But I will forgive them and I'm going to move on. Even if they don't ask for it, just in your heart, God help me forgive them. Help it be over with. And God will do that. Okay? He promised he would, that in that prayer that Jesus gave us, if Jesus said that that was part of you know, uh, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If that's part of the prayer that we pray, of course God is ready to give us the grace to do what God has called on us to do. Okay? So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a man giving another man uh, absolution or absolvement or wh wh whatever word works there and forgiving them of their sins so that in heaven their sins are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm talking about. So I found a website and it's a Catholic, I think it's Catholic Answers or CatholicQuestions.com, something like that. But the, the question Somebody asked the question, uh, you know, only God can forgive sin, so how is it that priests think they can forgive sin? So the answer from the Catholic Church is this. In Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, we find what you are saying in the story of the healing of the paralytic. When Jesus saw the paralytic, he said to him, your sins are forgiven. Now, he said, describes gave the same objection that you raised. That is, 
that only God can forgive sins. They asked, who can forgive sins except God alone? And they were right. This is what the Catholic Church is saying. This is what a priest is saying. But notice how Jesus changes this later in the story. No, he don't. Turn to Mark. You know, I just don't like it when people uh, tell you what they believe and uh, put up alleged scriptures when you actually read the scriptures especially in the King James you find out that they've fallen far short and uh, the reason why they don't print out the scriptures and highlight why they believe what they believe is that it's really not there in most cases it's really not there Mark chapter 2 um, uh, again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Um, look at verse, oh, let's see here. This is where they're going to lower him down. In verse 4, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Jesus was showing that whole crowd, I'm God. I'm God. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they saw, what? Just remember, when you're around Jesus, he can read your thoughts. Amen. You might get away with it with people, but you ain't going to get away with it with Jesus. Amen. He knows. So he says, uh, he perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves and said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is, is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he rose, took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Notice they glorified who? God, where the glory belongs. But in the Catholic Church and in these other churches, they steal God's glory by saying that they can forgive their sins. So this guy, this priest says, uh, the scribes gave the same objection that you raised, that is, that only God can forgive sins. They asked, who can forgive sins except God alone? And they were right. But notice how Jesus changes this later. No, he doesn't. He doesn't change anything. This later in the story, he performs the miracle of healing precisely to show that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So what was once only in heaven is now on earth because Jesus has the authority to forgive. That is the stupidest argument I've ever heard in my life. What they're saying is that Jesus brought the ability for people to forgive other people's sins from heaven down to earth. Now that it's down here on earth, then the men whom Jesus calls to be his priests, they now have the ability to forgive everybody's sins. You see what they did? Jesus does nothing of the sort when he says, um, verse 10, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin. Who is the Son of Man? He's the Son of God, Jesus Christ. There is no other. Is no other. The Son of... And see, they even capitalize Son just like the King James does. They're talking about Christ and yet they're saying now that Jesus has brought this down to the earth, now the, the forgiveness of man's sins can be done on the earth. It's a ridiculous, ridiculous argument. But... People then content themselves with this. And let me, let me just tell you this. Here you have this man um, who in some cases, and I'm not making this up, they are related to or they are linked in with some form of organized crime. It's done in Kenya. 
it's done here in America. I told you the story about uh, we had a, a family, um, the wife's brother, his wife was having an affair with a Catholic priest in St. Louis up on the hill uh, in the Italian area of St. Louis. She was having an ongoing affair with this priest and he was directly linked in with the St. Louis organized crime, Italian organized crime. And laundering money, um, doing all kinds of evil things, uh, pimping girls out, you name it. He was, he was a part of that. And here this man now, he says, I can forgive your sins. So what he does is all these organized crime people, they get told, go, see, go down and see Father Antonio. Okay? Father Antonio will forgive all your sins, but you better give him, better give him some, some coin. And so these people who live this lifestyle believe they can go into the Catholic Church, Father Antonio will say all kinds of words around them, listen to their confession, make the sign of the cross, absolve them of their sins, and they think now they're going to heaven. What a racket. Amen? The love of money still is the root of all evil. It still is. So he says, so what was once only in heaven is now on earth because Jesus has the authority to forgive. And then later he says, yes, there was once a man on earth who could forgive sins. It was the one who was fully God and fully man. And I assume that if Jesus Christ were on earth again, forgiveness of sins would be on earth again. I, I just, no, it's retarded. It's stupid. Amen. Uh, Jesus can forgive our sins because he is our great high priest, but the Catholic faith, not the Bible, says that Jesus' priesthood was also given to men. Where does it say that? So that they could continue his earthly work of forgiving sins. And the objector said, where does the Bible say that? Yeah. Good grief. And people are... People will believe this because it's convenient. See, they don't have to actually give anything up. They can just go do whatever they want as long as they make a quote-unquote good confession and name names and name times and name deeds and 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 by the way if i understand right uh venial sins are like lesser sins that your local priest can forgive but if you commit mortal sins then you must go to an archbishop or a cardinal or the pope only they can forgive uh cardinals uh mortal sins Am I, is that right? Am I saying that right? I'm pretty sure I found that out. Yeah, if you murder somebody, the local priest can't forgive you. You have to go, you have to work your way up. And of course, money is going to be involved in it. You better bring a sack full of dough, okay? Because they're going to require it. They're not going to hear your confession. You come empty-handed. That is a racket. That belongs, that, is, that belongs under the definition of racketeering, okay? It is a scam on people, and people are selling their souls to the Catholic Church. Huh? 
1.3 billion people in this world are that stupid. Yeah. See, I mean, I know none of us are perfect. But I want to be, and I want our church to be, I want us to strive against sin. And, and ask God, God, over time, take this all out of my life. I don't want any more of it. Just get it away and so on. You don't, you don't hear Catholics praying that. And some of them literally, especially when it comes to monks and nuns, they will beat themselves. They will scourge themselves until blood is running down their legs. And, and all of that is intended to drive away lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. Anytime you feel lust as a monk, then you go in and you grab that, I forgot what it's called, but you start scourging yourself and, and letting blood run all down your back and everything like that and be in so much pain that you're now out of the mood, you're no, you're no longer lusting anymore. And Martin Luther did that. Martin Luther was a monk, and he beat himself, and he scourged himself, and he, he isolated himself so that he didn't see women, and he just put himself away, and he's reading Romans, and he's mad at God because God's demanding him that he must be as righteous as God is. That's how Martin Luther thinks now, because that's what he's been taught. But then the Holy Ghost got a hold of him. and said, hey, Marty, let me show you what this really is. It's not the righteousness that I demand from you. It's the righteousness that I'm going to give to you free of charge. Light came on. And glory filled that man. I, can you imagine being under all that bondage, and then one day you're reading the scriptures and all of a sudden God frees you from that. Wow. Let me keep reading. The Catholic Church says in John 20, verse 19, oh, look where we are. Let me read it. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said unto them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, the objector says, so what is the formula of absolution? What he means by that is, what pre-scripted words must the priest say? And you may not understand this, but in the Catholic Mass, everything that that priest says is scripted, and he must stick with the script. He can't go off. He must say the magic words in order to turn the wafer into a piece of meat from Jesus. Okay? Yeah. And so... That's the, the formula of absolution. That's what he's talking about. What words must the priest say? Now, where in the Bible does it give us the formula of absolution? Does it? So he says, it's the words that a priest uses to confer or convey the forgiveness of Christ once a person has confessed his sins. This absolution is based directly on Jesus' words in John 20, verse 19 through 23. It says, God the Father of mercies through the death and resurrection of His Son has reconciled the world to Himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sin through the ministry of the church. They stuck themselves in there. May God give you pardon and peace and I, I absolve you. Not Christ, I do. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, how much of that comes from John 20, verses 19 through 23? How much? None. None. Yet, he says it's based directly on Jesus' words in John 20, verse 19 through 23. So he says, I absolve you 
from your sins. And now that poor soul walks away with a false hope given to him by a false prophet teaching a false gospel and speaking of a false Christ and another spirit. Amen? It's exactly what Paul warned us about. So he says, a priest is not God, but the priest has the power to confer or convey the forgiveness of God, not by his own power, but by the power that Christ conferred on his apostles that day recorded for us in John 20, verse 19 through 23. The objector says, yes, but didn't your formula of absolution have the priest saying, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? That sounds like it's the priest who is doing the forgiving. Yeah. The objector says, yes, but didn't your formula of absolution have the priest... I had already put that in there. That sounds like it's the priest who is doing the forgiving. Uh... Where was I going with this? Let's turn to Matthew 18 real quickly. Here is what, this is what I can see in scriptures concerning this ability to forgive sins, remit sins, or retain sins. And... Um, I've never, I've never had to have a church trial on someone. I hope never to have to do that. Um, because it's just, I, I just hate the thought of it. Um, I have had to ask people to submit uh, resignation of their membership uh, so that it didn't go that far and they did if they are not a member a a real member voted on member of this church I really have I don't think I have the authority um, because namely because I want people who are full of sin to come into the church. I want them here. Um, and, and if they are saved, then obviously then it's a time to grow and let God change them and so on. And, um, but I, I've, had to, I've had to stand my ground a time or two uh, over the last 27, 28 years, something like that. And I never liked it. I never did. Here's what I believe. Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Now, this, we're talking about a brother, a someone in the church. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. It's over with. Does the church at that point need to know what they did? Nobody needs to know. Nobody has a right to know. Nobody needs to know. I am bound legally, legally, that if someone confesses something to me, uh, aside from um, anything involving children, if someone confesses something to me and they want it kept secret, then I'm just as bound as a, as a Catholic priest is. I'm bound by the law. And if I... Um, if I make public what someone has told me in private, um, they can, we, we better get ready to write a check because it's going to cost us, okay? Uh, they'll have the right to sue us for damages and they'll get it. Um, so anyway, um, I learned that years ago. But anyway, so he says, uh, verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So now you have a witness, and I would, I would say 
that it should be a witness who is at least somewhat aware of what the person did. Um, it doesn't say that in particular, but a witness tells what they know. Uh, or it may be in this case, the witness is there to hear what uh, the sinner, uh, what, what conclusion they come to. Are they going to repent? Uh, or are they going to stand their ground and, and, um, and not repent and say, I'm not, I'm not apologizing, I'm, I don't think I did anything wrong. And um, so it could be that that witness is there as a second and a third witness to hear what the sinner has to say. So that it's not just one person's word against another when it comes to the church. Verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear them, here it is now. We have to have a meeting. And I guarantee you, I'm going to pray and fast before it. Tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church. Now all of this, the goal is restoration. The goal is not punishment. The goal is not ridding the church. The goal is restoration. Give everybody a chance to repent. Amen? That God, that's what God is doing now. Giving everybody a chance to repent. And so, uh, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you. Now listen to this. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That is almost identical to what he said in John. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So in that, in that trial, when maybe I've gone to somebody, we talked, they didn't, they didn't repent. Um, I came back with two or three witnesses. They still didn't repent. If I bring them to the church and all of a sudden God come, moves in their heart and they break down and they cry and they say, you know what, I need to repent. The whole church is going to witness. They're repenting, amen, and it's over with. But if they don't repent, then God has given us the authority to put them out of our congregation. Um, you know, I mentioned it uh, last Sunday. God didn't bless the camp of Israel under Joshua because of Achan and him stealing stuff that he saw there in Ai or wherever it was. And so Joshua said, we got to get rid of this sin. We got to get it out of our midst. And we got to take care of this guy who did the sin because I guarantee you I'm not going against them again and losing more men. And so that's what he did. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And so I believe that it's not, it's not my forgiveness of them. It's not me alone is that we bring them before the church and we plead with them in tears, praying and hoping that God will, will work in that person's life and, and cause them to repent and, and godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation and that now they're, they're down at the altar and everybody that's there, we're all down at the altar praying with them. And saying, God, thank you. God, thank you. Oh, God, have mercy on us all. But if they don't repent, then we put them out. And I believe God is saying here, if, if you do it this way and have to put them out, well, I'm not going to go behind your back and forgive them secretly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them out too. You, if you 
retain their sins and will not, they, they, and you can't forgive them because they won't repent, put them out. And God says, I'm going to honor that. I'm going to stand with you on that. But if they repent and you pray with them and you believe that repentance is genuine, I'll stand behind you too. I'll forgive them. Because you did it the way I told you to do it. You did it with the right heart. And I'll tell you what, that's where loving your fellow church member comes in handy. If you love the people you go to church with, you won't have a problem forgiving them. And if you, and if you are sinning, and I have to come to you or somebody has to come to you and you love your church and you love me and you love your church members and you love God, I guarantee you, you'll repent, you'll be forgiven, it'll be over with and it'll be done. And God will bless that. Amen? God will bless that. So this, this nonsense of a earthly priesthood going around doing this and saying these words uh, I found out why they why there was such a upheaval years ago when they decided to start saying the mass in the language that people could understand the reason why the Catholic Church was retaining Latin for all of their uh, services and all of their their masses or whatever it is they did is because they said universally then they're all speaking the exact same words so whether you are in Africa or China or Europe or America or wherever you are when that priest is saying those words in Latin rest assured that everybody else who is a priest is saying the exact same words and we don't have to worry about translating that to another language and maybe that language doesn't really have the same meaning of a particular word in Latin that it would mean in French or Spanish or something else. That's why so many Catholics and Catholic priests did not want to change the Mass from Latin to whatever the language they spoke, uh, but eventually it got changed and oh well.